All right, thanks everyone for jumping on this month. My name is Rich Monroe, and this is the BNB Investing Group. Uh, as an REI USA member, uh, this session is free to attend. Uh, we do this every first Tuesday of the month, and we talk about short term rentals and uh, what's going on in as far as different attributes. And this, this month, we're actually going to talk about you know, what's going on statistically with travel. Uh, I know we're all kind of seeing what's occurring with the recent uh, variant and the shutdown again with the international travel. And I just wanted to kind of share some, some data with everybody about what's currently going on as it pertains to short-term rentals. I know some of us might be uh, interested in starting uh, investing and uh, doing this strategy. And so I thought this might be a good way to kind of give everyone an oversight of what's going on in the industry, uh, what we're currently experiencing uh, with the types of guests, the length of stay, uh, the average daily rate, uh, and things of that nature. <clears throat> just to make sure, is everyone able, if one person or two people could just tell me uh, if you're seeing my screen right now where it says travel Re Re revolution and data. Um, I want to just make sure that we, Good. Okay. Um, and so, you know, Airbnb, uh, most of you that uh, have uh, been on my sessions, uh, you know, there's a reason why I talk quite a lot about Airbnb. They are kind of the, the forerunner in this space. This is what's really made uh, short-term rentals successful uh, and really have the ability to do short-term rentals anywhere in the world right now uh, is a big reason. A big part of that is because of Airbnb. Uh, those of us that have been uh, hosting for quite a while, uh, you know, obviously we're running this like a business, so we're on multiple platforms. And um, no matter what you do, you know, 80% plus of your revenue is going to come from uh, the Airbnb platform. And so it's only uh, prudent to make sure that we kind of pay attention to what's going on, um, you know, as far as uh, Airbnb is seeing things. Uh, and so this is actually a study. Uh, that they've recently conducted and kind of a survey that they did across five countries. A lot of this is probably obvious to everyone because you're kind of living the same thing that we've all experienced with the, uh, the pandemic and uh, folks working remotely and um, having, uh, you know, that drastic change and extreme change in the way that we think about traveling. Um, so they did it for 7,500 uh, consumers and uh, basically uh, identified that about a third of, of folks um, are hybrid or remote employees. Um, and basically they'd rather quit their jobs and go back to work in person full time now that they've experienced that. Uh, nearly half of the nights booked on Airbnb were for at least a week compared to 38% two years ago. So there's definitely an extreme shift. Uh, you know, and obviously we're on this technology called Zoom. Uh, which makes uh, you know possible to do a lot of these things from anywhere from your home, uh, and this is kind of a new new flexibility in the way that we think about traveling as well, and not having to be tied to an eight to five or or, or to an actual office. Um, even in recent months, some of the larger companies, Procter and Gamble, Ford, Amazon, have announced uh, allowing the flexibility of employees to be able to work remotely, and uh, you know a lot of the other companies seem to be potentially following their lead. You know, so the, the um, majority of the respondents, you know, and this is another interesting aspect, um, are doing more travel in the following ways during off-peak times, which again, you know, does nothing but help our industry um, over longer weekends. And we're starting to see more uh, activity during the week. You know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesdays usually used to be a gaping hole. Uh, but because of the longer stays, and again, folks that are flexibly working remotely, um, that is definitely increasing as well. Uh, so, you know, like I'm saying, July to September, 20% uh, of those bookings were for a month or longer. Uh, so guests are spending a lot more time uh, than they have before uh, in, in doing short-term rentals. Uh, 200 destinations around the world. Uh, people are already living on Airbnb. 30% of guests in these places have found have been longer-term stays. 
There's a dozen plus destinations, at least 50% of the nights were for long-term stays. Um, and 100,000 guests have stayed continuous on Airbnb for at least three months. Um, so a lot of them are kind of hopping around. Uh, you know, um, uh, folks that are older and have that flexibility uh, or, or, or a good chunk of that. And nearly half uh, families during the week globally, again, like I talked about before, they're showing the most growth in stays Mondays and Tuesday nights. And so when we used to have a calendar where you had Mondays and Tuesdays empty, you know, that has a, a direct impact in your occupancy rates. And so now with that Monday, Tuesday nights being full, it's definitely been a, a huge improvement in, in occupancy. U.S. longer weekend stays of three to four days grew by one third over the same time in 2019. So, you know, the way that we're traveling is also changing a shift in the way, what our needs are as far as what the travelers are looking for. And, um, you know, most of the searched items in recent months for amenities were uh, for pets being allowed, swimming pools, Wi-Fi, kitchens, and free parking. And so, you know, the allowing for pets increased by 55% as far as listings go. You know, historically, um, it's probably less than 20% of listings would even allow pets. And so if you're looking at strategically, uh, you know, again, trying to maximize your occupancy, uh, you know, definitely, um, you know, including pets as a part of your uh, allowed stay uh, can give you a strategic advantage, especially now where there's a lot more folks that are actually traveling doing that. Um, you can generate additional revenue. Obviously, there's the risk of uh, more damage and so on. But, you know, if you kind of limit it, we on some of our Tampa listings, we limit it to um, smaller pets. You know, but what it does for your revenue is if it's one or two pets that are coming on that trip, if it's a five day stay, you can basically charge $30 to $35 per pet per night. Uh, and it can definitely kind of give you a boost in the revenue. So that's something if you've got properties that have uh, fenced in backyards, and things like that uh, might be something uh, good to consider. <clears throat> you know, obviously the, the Wi-Fi for the obvious reasons is a big uh, demand and making sure that you've got stable Wi-Fi. Uh, you know, it's probably a good thing to, to go overboard in terms of uh, when you're setting up your short-term rentals to make sure that your Wi-Fi is uh, more powerful than, than, you than you typically would need just so that you don't have any issues with it. Uh, you know, especially when you've got four and five bedroom homes uh, that you wanna make sure that you have, if you've got uh, that many people screaming on different devices, uh, that you're not going to have uh, any issues there. <clears throat> Same thing with laptop friendly spaces, uh, which is workspaces, which have increased by 73%. Again, you know, for folks that are moving around and still working, uh, they want to have that flexibility. You know, just having um, the directive of the dining room table is not going to really work anymore. You want to be able to have a workspace that's potentially private and um, allows them to be comfortable in, in doing that. So again, I know um, we, we're currently under some potential um, shutdowns with what's currently going on with this new variant, you know, but up, up until uh, a few weeks ago, you know, everything was kind of optimistic and opening back up for international travel. And uh, we were all kind of looking forward to, um, you know, having that additional uh, resource of different types of guests that are, that are basically coming in from other countries and uh, having the ability to, again, drive your occupancy up. Um, so hopefully, you know, um, we, we've got a kind of a short-lived, um, you know, you still have a lot of cross-border traveling that's, that's occurring. Um, folks are not getting on planes, they're kind of driving through the destinations. And, um, you know, that's increasing a lot, uh, quite a bit as well. Uh, so what I also want to do, um, if everyone can see my screen, I just want to make sure that this video plays. I want us to watch a quick video. 
Brian, what's been on your mind? If everybody could just let me know. What's I been mean, on my mind is the whole world's the changed. And the way we live has changed. I mean, to give you an example, for centuries, people have been tethered to where they work, which meant they couldn't go very far from it. They were, they were connected to it. First it was the farm, is everybody able to then see the, the factory, video? then the office. But then the pandemic hit and it's really turned the world on its head. No, okay, one second. All right, how about now? Brian, what's been on your mind lately? What's been on my mind is the whole- And I'm gonna pause it. All right, we're able to see it now? Okay, good. All right, so this is um, Brian Chesky, the CEO of Airbnb, uh, announcing uh, up to 50 different um, new things that Airbnb is doing that I thought would be useful the whole for world's everybody to changed. see. And the way we live has changed. I mean, to give you an example, for centuries, people have been tethered to where they work, which meant they couldn't go very far from it. They were, they were connected to it. First it was the farm, then the factory, then the office. But then the pandemic hit, and it's really turned the world on its head. There were these massive changes, and one of the really big changes is for millions of people, they've been untethered from where they have to work. They could go anywhere and work anywhere. It's a sense of freedom that people have never had before. Today, I'm working from a new place and I'm excited to see it. I actually like walking into a house with a wonder, like, wow, I'm discovering this whole new world. But at the same time, I like walking like it's my home. And I just like immediately settle in. The first thing I do is figure out where I can put the laptop down and start working. Technology made it possible to work from home. But what Airbnb does is allow you to work from any home. And for the last year, we've been thinking about this and reimagining our service to respond to this moment. And I'm excited to share our winter release. It's got over 50 upgrades and innovations, and I'm gonna show you four of them, starting with I'm even more flexible. In May, we launched I'm Flexible. It's a whole new way to search when you're flexible about where or when you're traveling. Now, since launch, I'm Flexible has been used 517 million times. This feature is so popular that today, we're introducing I'm Even More Flexible. Let me show you. Airbnb has tons of unique homes, like tree houses, or A-frames, yurts, we even have entire private islands that you can book and amazing pools. Well, today we're introducing four new categories. First is ski and ski out. These are great for family or friends if you wanna go skiing. We have homes that are off the grid if you really wanna get away. We now have Lux. These are some of the most extraordinary homes in the world with five-star service. And finally, my favorite, offbeat homes, like this one. You can sleep in a shoe, a UFO, a snake. Look at this. Here's a potato. This is a giant russet Burbank potato. So let's say I wanna take a look at this property and you can sleep in a potato. People are also more flexible about when they can travel. And this is beyond the six month date range we provided. So now you can search I'm flexible up to 12 months in advance. So as you can see, the date range now goes out an entire year. Now among the big changes we're seeing is the return of international travel. Lots of people will be looking for Airbnbs in different countries and in different languages from the ones they speak. And we wanted to make the translations on Airbnb better. Our new technology is called Translation Engine. But before I show it to you, let me show you how the old translation technology worked. So let's say you were looking for a place in France. I'm gonna type in Brittany and I'd search. 
and you get these listings. And if you didn't speak French, you'd have to tap Translate to English. And you get your translation. And here it is. House, feet in the water. Hmm. We, we knew we could probably do a little better than that. So let's see how our new translation engine compares. Beachfront house. Now that's better. Now the translations now happen automatically without tapping any buttons. Translation engine automatically translates reviews as well. Reviews are really, really helpful when you're choosing your stay. And soon, over 5 million active listings will be translated into 62 different languages. And the translation engine will have translated 500 million reviews. Now Airbnb has something for everyone, but it's important that everyone can use Airbnb. To make Airbnb homes more accessible for a disability community, we've created Accessibility Review. Let's say you or someone you're traveling with uses a wheelchair, and you're looking for a place that doesn't have steps. You want a place with an easy to access entrance. So you just tap on filters here, go down the page to accessibility, and tap show all accessibility features. Then select the features you need, like a step-free guest entrance or a wide building entryway. We offer 13 accessibility features you can search for. Now, based on your selection, you would only see homes with step-free guest entrances and wide entryways like this one. Now, not only do you see photos of the specific features, but now each and every one of those photos is independently reviewed by two highly trained agents. If there's any discrepancy between these reviews, a third agent is brought in to conduct an even more detailed review. Finally, it's sent to the Airbnb accessibility team for one last review. Airbnb agents have reviewed and confirmed the accuracy of accessibility features in 25,000 homes around the world. And they include even places you wouldn't expect, like this treehouse. More and more people are working from Airbnbs, so they need really good Wi-Fi. Now, we know this matters. Our Wi-Fi search filter has been used 288 million times this year. Now. To help our guests see how fast the Wi-Fi is before they book, we created Verified Wi-Fi. Let's say you want to check the Wi-Fi at Niski Business. This is my childhood home that I grew up at in Niski, in New York. You just go to the Niski Business listing right here. You see it's got fast Wi-Fi. So now you can easily see the speed before booking. For hosts, we made it really easy to verify their Wi-Fi speed. Just go to where it says Wi-Fi and test the Wi-Fi within the app. Now, once I tap add to listing, it's verified on the listing page. And that's it. So now, when you book an Airbnb, you can be sure it has great Wi-Fi. Now, I've got one last thing to tell you about, and I'm really, really excited about this. You know, our hosts are our partners, and they're sharing their most prized and personal possessions, their homes. And we want to do everything that we can to protect them. And we want to provide extra reassurance for new hosts before they take that first big step. So today, we are introducing AirCover. AirCover is top to bottom protection for every host. Now, AirCover starts with the amazing benefits that we already give every host. A million dollars in liability insurance, a million dollars in damage protection, and income loss protection. People are staying at Airbnb's longer, and they're bringing their pets with them. So we've added pet damage protection. And we're also adding deep cleaning protection. We've extended the window for filing damage claims to 14 days. So now, you don't have to worry if you have back-to-back -back bookings. Finally, we're providing faster reimbursements for hosts. And we're creating an even faster fast track for super hosts. Air cover is top to bottom protection, free for every host and only on Airbnb. So many things have just changed, right? The way that we live just changed, the way we work, the way we travel. As the world changes, it's our job to design for that world. And the faster the world changes, the more there's an imperative to design for that world. And I think we're just getting started. There's a lot to design. And that, that, that to me is what makes it so fun.
right, again, you know, there's over 50 of these changes that Airbnb is making. And those of you that have already been on Airbnb recognize that it's a good and a bad thing, right? So they're always making changes and or improvements, but from, you know, someone that's kind of uh, used to having things done a certain way, uh, constant change isn't always a good thing. But I think a lot of the changes that they're doing here uh, are definitely, um, you know, a benefit towards uh, the investor owner or the host. You know, a lot of the, and, and, you know, the importance of understanding the flexibility and, and kind of the way that they are targeting guests now. Uh, you know, historically, our calendars would usually be open, you know, 60 to 90 days into the future, uh, just because, you know, some of our uh, hosts are doing rental arbitrage or um, uh, we're doing rehabs on properties and we might want to have the option to sell it at some point. And so you always had a tight window of accepting bookings because you don't want to have to cancel on those guests. But now understanding this flexibility and the way that guests are viewing uh, the way to travel now, um, you know, we've got most of our calendars open for the next six to eight months, in some cases, 12 months, depending on the property, uh, because of the way that folks are kind of viewing um, and having the flexibility uh, to do the, do the travel. So I think it's good to understand you know, that component of it when you're deciding, you know, how to, um, to get started with opening or closing your calendar. Uh, you know, the air cover is definitely uh, a good uh, positive move. You know, the, you know, most of you probably already familiar that Airbnb already had a um, million dollars in guarantees for damage protection, um, but they had the, the controls on that quite tight. And you have to jump through a couple of hoops to get reimbursed whenever you had an issue. So um, opening up the 14-day filing window, um, the deep cleaning protection, you know, historically, one of the, the, the main things that hosts complain about and that we have issues with are smokers. Um, smoking, you know, marijuana or smoking cigarettes inside the home. And the next guest coming in and, and canceling the reservation because it's not a comfortable environment. Uh, historically, before now, uh, it was very difficult to file a claim with Airbnb, even though most of us would have uh, no smoking policies crystal clear on our list and description and have fines incorporated with uh, anywhere from $250 to $500 uh, as a penalty. Uh, but it's, it was very difficult to, to actually collect on that. And it's actually very difficult to prove that somebody has smoked, uh, you know, during their stay. Uh, so that's one of the things with their deep cleaning protection that they've kind of loosened up. And we've actually been able to successfully uh, recently get reimbursed for uh, folks that have smoked in our, in our units or in, in our homes or apartments. Um, the 14 day filing window is another big one. Uh, you, you know, they, you'd probably, um, have a very difficult time uh, in getting your claim filed if it's two, three, four days after that person's checked out. Uh, and so the fact that they're loosening the reins there, I think is a very positive thing as well uh, to kind of give you more flexibility. Um, the pet damage protection, like I mentioned, there's a lot more folks traveling with pets. And um, so they're making it a specific uh, coverage and something that they, uh, you know, plan on kind of um, making sure that we get reimbursed for any issues or damage from pets. Uh, one of the other things which historically they've never done uh, and <laughs> is uh, if you have an issue with bed bugs, right, which will happen. We have guests coming and going. Uh, we've been doing this for five years now. We probably had three different occurrences, which so we've been pretty fortunate. But um, as you can imagine, when it does happen, it's a very expensive process to get that cleaned up and could take between uh, two to three days. Um, and so they've all, this income loss protection feature is also uh, something that's very positive because, you know, they will be, and I've just recently got reimbursed for bed bugs at one of our two bedroom apartments over in Tucker. And um, uh, we were able to get reimbursed fully for the cost of an extermination company to go in uh, and get that corrected. Um, you can also file for income loss protection too, which is good. Um, uh, Sheila was asking, how was I able to do that? And I think that's referring to the smoking uh, reimbursement. Um, 
you basically are able to, so here's the thing, you can provide uh, documentation to basically substantiate your claim. And it's very difficult to have somebody make an argument against your claim if you've got screenshots of the message thread of the new guest that just checked in that basically canceled the reservation as a result of the home smelling like cigarette smoke or marijuana or whatever it is. Um, so when you, when you file the claim against uh, the previous guest that caused that to happen, uh, you include a screenshot of the new guest that came in and canceled. Um, you can also file a claim for that revenue too, by the way, uh, as loss of revenue. Um, any uh, evidence with, when the cleaners did their inspection, when that other guest checked out, uh, pictures of ashes um, or cigarette butts. Uh, we had one of our Tampa, Florida properties. They didn't smoke inside that, or they didn't have an evidence inside the house, but in the patio area, they had probably um, uh, seemed to be like 100 cigarette butts. Uh, and so, you know, you have to basically um, provide that proof. The other key thing to prove, provide is a screenshot of your listing description that shows that you don't allow smoking and that there's a fine of X dollars amount, you know, between 350 to $500. Um, and so that that's armed with that information. Um, historically, it didn't matter what you did in the past with Airbnb, you would not get anything for uh, smoking. It was very difficult. And that's what I'm trying to explain now that they're kind of opening up uh, and, and being a little bit more uh, protective of their hosts. Uh, they are starting to uh, accept those types of claims. Um, uh, Valley is asking, did my cleaners find the bed bugs or did the guests? Um, so the most recent incident that we got reimbursed for, it wasn't uh, the next guest uh, that checked in that um, identified the bed bugs. And um, we basically got them relocated to another location and um, you know, had the uh, extermination company come in and take care of it. And so that, that typically can happen. Now, so a lot of the other things that, that were talked about, um, some of the things that were not talked about in, uh, in Brian Chesky's um, announcement of this, uh, you know, obviously the translation engine is good to be able to communicate directly with other uh, international travelers. The access accessibility thing I think is good. Again, for those of you that have properties that have that ability, um, will definitely give you a competitive advantage to drive uh, occupancy. Uh, the Wi-Fi verification on the listing uh, is definitely something that's good so that there's not any uh, question regarding the speed of the Wi-Fi that you'll have at that listing. Um, you know, the Ask a Superhost expansion, uh, I'm actually uh, an Airbnb ambassador, so I participate um, in that program. So when you first set up a listing, if you um, want some, some help and some pointers on uh, being successful, um, I can send you a link uh, to get it, get you invited as a host, and then I can spend some time with you one on one uh, to look at your listing and give you some some tips on, and strategies on you know max, maximizing your revenue there. Um, and so that is something that is is, is also very beneficial. Several other things here um, it, that they've added. And all of this is obviously on the Airbnb platform. So if there's an area of particular interest uh, that you guys have, you can go back and, and take a look at that. Um, so that's, that's what's known on Airbnb. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to cover, you know, it's great to look at the surveys and, um, you know, understand what some of the uh, data is telling you. Uh, but I wanted to take a look uh, at exactly, you know, historically, now that we're kind of um, in a different place than we were two years ago, you know, how has that impacted statistics and, and revenue on um, short-term rentals and vacation rentals? And so there's a group called Key Data. Uh, that basically let, takes these um, statistics uh, and kind of tracks different data points on a historical basis to kind of give us an overview of what's going on um, in the industry. 
And so this was a recent uh, report that they did uh, and reported on that kind of gave us some of that data. Before I dig into it, again, just want to confirm um, that everyone's able to see my screen. If I could just get one or two yeses, uh, you should see key data with some balloons, some balloons on there to the right. All right, perfect. Just want to make sure that I'm not rambling on ahead and nobody's able to see my screen. So that's good. Thanks for confirming. Uh, let's see, Sheila, so let's see. Yeah, okay, we're good. All right, perfect. All right, so as I mentioned, uh, key data basically has direct integrations with all the reservation systems for uh, vacation rental professionals, hotels, resorts around the world, and they aggregate uh, the historical uh, and forward-looking information in real time to create a big source of data for analytics. Uh, they also scrape all the major online travel agencies and um, uh, the, the online platforms, so Airbnb, VRBO, Booking.com, and then they basically um, combine that data here. And so this is kind of showing us where we are at the moment in terms of uh, performance. And uh, these are the key uh, attributes that no surprise, obviously the occupancy rate, uh, which those of you that have kind of looked at market analysis realize that's the first thing you want to understand is the occupancy rate. Um, obviously the number of nights booked by the guest out of the available nights in that period. So it's usually you're looking at a monthly percentage rate. So if you're at 50% occupancy in a month then you're at 15 days for the month. Um, and so basically, you know, from uh, paid occupancy of 52%, 10% uh, over 2020 and 10% over 2019. Um, the average daily rate is the other attribute that we want to look at. Average revenue generated per guest night. So that's the nightly rate. And that typically does not include the cleaning fees or any other fees that are associated with it. Um, and so that's Another component, uh, the US average was at 301, um, which is, or is currently at 301, uh, which is 43% uh, improvement, 17% over 2020 and 19% over 2019. <clears throat> the other one that we, we don't tend to, to pay much attention to, but um, you know, if you're gonna be running this at scale, you wanna make sure you understand the rev par. Uh, historically, that's usually been used by hotels, um, but it's a good uh, barometer to um, track trends. And so what RevPAR is, is revenue per available rental. And so you're basically taking your occupancy uh, times your average daily rate uh, to come up with what they call the RevPAR number. And so we're currently in the U.S. at an average of 119, uh, which is uh, four. $40 increase or 50% over 2020 and a $34 increase over 2019. And so when we look at strategically, you know, uh, from a position standpoint, people always ask you when they're new to a space, well, is it a good time to get in? Uh, and for short-term rentals, as you can see, uh, you know, we're definitely uh, moving in in an upward direction from where we have been historically. And so just to demonstrate it from a time perspective, you know, this is looking at uh, the trend throughout the year of 2021 and the bars, the solid one is basically uh, what's going on in, in 2021. And the other two are 2019 and 2020. And so obviously, um, the percentage occupancies are definitely higher than the last several years. Look at the same thing for the average nightly rate or average daily rate. And you see that consistent trend that the average daily rate year over year is definitely outpacing uh, where we were, you know, 
$60 increase over 2019 as your average daily rate uh, across the board. Then the rev par number again, which is a number that's used uh, mostly in the hotel industry, but it's something that you should good to be aware of. Um, that number has also increased quite a bit since 2019 uh, for 2021. Now, this is pretty interesting in terms of the increases by area. This demonstrates like, uh, you know, where all of these occupancy rates have been higher, even though the average has been at a certain level. As you can notice, a lot is going on in the Southeast here as far as the increases. 50% um, increase in, in Miami, 50% in Tampa Bay area, 64% in Jacksonville. Uh, even even Atlanta uh, is up 56%. Obviously, the whole Southeast has benefited from a lot of those increases in travel. Um, you know, obviously, as you guys know, a lot of the um, shutdowns and state shutdowns weren't really impacted as much in the Southeast uh, as some of the other states, which obviously was a driver here to, uh, to, to drive uh, that statistic. Okay, this is also another interesting data point. Again, comparing the last several years, um, as far as the uh, the, the uh, average uh, rev par rate by property type. So again, this isn't the nightly rate; it's the rev par rate. Um, definitely increasing pretty substantially in houses for the obvious reasons. Um, people wanted, uh, you know, a lot of people are traveling in larger groups, uh, families. There's also uh, folks that are working that are traveling together and getting five and six bedroom houses um, instead of getting a bunch of different hotel rooms from an economic standpoint, um, definitely makes, makes more sense. So this is looking at United States adjusted paid occupancy. Comparing those periods. Versus last year. Similar analysis with the average daily rate again. And then this is giving us uh, some of the, the more profitable destinations for uh, winter travel from the ski industry. Again, if you have that as an option from a property standpoint, uh, showing you the occupancy rates, definitely increasing there substantially as well. Jackson Hole doing quite well. Uh, and then some of the beach properties, right? So. Gulf Shores, Orange Beach, Palm Springs, St. Pete and Clearwater Beach areas. Um, you know, you don't necessarily have to be on in the beach to, to, you know, enjoy some of the increases that are occurring here. Uh, you know, like we're in Tampa, none of our homes are within 30 minutes of a beach, but a lot of folks travel and go there to go to the beach. And um, they're okay with, uh, you know, driving instead of being physically there. So you can still take advantage of those increases by doing that. Same thing with occupancy rates. And then the, lastly, the ski destinations. Again, if you have that as an option, um, you know, those are some pretty robust nightly rates in the close to eight to nine hundred dollar range at some of those uh, destinations. So, I, you know, I want to point out, obviously, real estate as a whole has definitely increased 
price wise over the last several years. It depends though what kind of strategy you're doing um, in terms of uh, rental arbitrage, because you know the percentage increases that were that are being demonstrated here are not necessarily directly in sync with what we've seen in rental market rate increases in rent um, or ac actually in real estate. And so you can still, you know, be able to have uh, the benefit of a higher premium in, in short-term rental rates, but not necessarily uh, in parallel with what your cost is to set up that property. And so that's another kind of benefit going into 2022 strategically um, to know that, you know, with the occupancy and the nightly rates continuing to increase, uh, it definitely gives you some good opportunity there. Um, so if anyone has any questions or comments, uh, wanted to, again, it's good to see kind of the, the generic um, survey results, but to see it statistically, I think is pretty eye-opening as far as understanding uh, where we're, where we come and kind of where what direction uh, these nightly rates are going. Um, you know, obviously uh, we're looking at the vacation areas, but it's this is also consistent across the board in urban and city areas. Uh, we're seeing the same increase. Uh, you know, our occupancy in November and December, historically before. Um, uh, pre temp pre pandemic was in the 50 to 60 percent range, and right now we are trending in the 80 to 90 percent range for occupancy. And so it's definitely a different thought process, a different mindset in the way folks are deciding to move around. Uh, you know, obviously, with Airbnb going public, um, they uh, have put in a lot of money into promoting um, over the last uh, six or seven months. And, you know, they they probably before this year haven't really ran any commercials. They did a pretty aggressive commercial campaign um, just before the summer that was not only across several outlets um, where you would where you'd expect them, but they were also all over social media. And so with that being said, you've got a lot of new folks that have never really traveled with Airbnb or um, you know, knew, knew, know that option existed and uh, is also driving a lot of that occupancy uh, up. And so you can definitely tell that a lot of these increases are definitely going to continue uh, to trend in that direction. All right, does anybody have any questions? Because I also want to get some feedback from everybody. Uh, you know, we're going into a new year next year and I'd love to get uh, some suggestions on what you think would be beneficial for us to spend some time on as far as a different topic or a particular topic regarding short-term rentals. So I'd love to get your feedback. If you can put it in the chat box, if there's something of interest for you personally, that we haven't been covering this year that you wanna make sure we put on the agenda for next year, uh, please let me know. Uh, you know, we've done everything from uh, market analysis, price optimization, um, setting up uh, the property. You know, how do you set up a property? Uh, what are those uh, steps to take? Uh, and so, you know, please put on the chat box and um, we'll make sure that we kind of make some adjustments going into next year that we can make, make those things be a part of uh, what we cover each month. Uh, like Sheila was saying, I knew, I'm new to Airbnb and have a lot of questions regarding price customers who break the rules and contact Airbnb and reviews of customers. Yeah, those, those are all definitely good, 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 to good topics. Um, uh, unfortunately, a lot of times, most people that see Airbnb in the news are seeing the negative things that happen. Um, and uh, from people that are either throwing parties or from uh, coming in and, and tearing up the house. And so, 
you know, I can tell you statistically, we've probably hosted over eight or 9,000 guests over the last couple of years, and we've probably had less than two or three incidents. And so statistically, uh, when it does happen, and it does, it will happen, um, if you're doing your upfront vetting uh, in the beginning, you're definitely going to minimize uh, some of that risk as far as uh, folks that are breaking the rules. One of the number one things to do uh, to help with that is, and, and you're right, Sheila, we could probably have a whole session on this, this topic alone, but um, there's two, real, two key things to do right out of the gate to help mitigate that risk. One is uh, most of our listings have a minimum age requirement uh, of um, 21 and in a lot of cases 25 and in some of our larger properties uh, 30. And so when you cut out uh, a good chunk of the population that uh, are more prone to having issues with parties and um, smoking inside the property and things of that nature, um, that helps cut out. One of the other obvious ones is the minimum night stay. And so if you shrink your minimum night stay down to a night, uh, which, which a lot of uh, folks that have listings do do that, um, you are gonna get a lot of those issues that come up. Um, so most of our properties have a three night minimum. Um, and in some cases we have uh, four or five night minimums. And so that's another way to kind of minimize that. Um, the other things on here, which again, we could have a session separately on each one of these, right? So pricing uh, all on its own, uh, there are multiple price optimization tools in the marketplace that integrate directly with the listing and uh, change the price on a daily basis. Um, and basically give you some market intelligence based on supply and demand. And um, also gives you some strategies where you can do discounting. Uh, if the bookings aren't occurring on a Monday or Tuesday, for example, you can do a deeper discount. Uh, you can set your minimum price. Um, one of the first things that folks try to do when they engage with Airbnb for the first time is um, they're going to recommend that you use what's called smart pricing. And um, of everything so far that you've heard me talk about with Airbnb, it's been very positive. So um, this is one of those things where the smart pricing tool that Airbnb provides is definitely not in your best interest to use that tool, uh, simply because Airbnb's interest is a little bit, it's not directly aligned with you as the individual host. Uh, they're, they're, you know, so the Airbnb platform charges a 3% fee to host, and they, they well deserve that fee. Um, however, uh, their, their main objective is to drive volume, right? So the more folks that are booking sooner, um, the better off they are uh, to, to kind of pump volume. So the price recommendations that they put out there uh, on their smart pricing tool is typically going to be, um, you know, probably 20 to 30 percent below where it could be. Now, it may take a little bit longer to book, but... Um, Historically, we found that the smart pricing tool is usually going to be uh, much lower than what you could actually uh, potentially get uh, on the listing. Um, so other than Sheila, is there anyone else that has any suggestions or recommendations of things that we would like to cover going into next year? Please put that in the chat box. I, I'm definitely going to be uh, taking these comments and um, figuring out our agenda for January, February, and March. And so uh, please do that before we conclude. Um, the other part of Sheila's uh, notes are uh, the reviews of customers. Uh, again, we could have a whole uh, session that talks about strategically how to manage through that. Uh, as most of you know, that's gonna make or break you uh, in this business based on the reviews, right? So uh, pretty much everything that we do as an operation uh, the objective is to get that five-star review, whether it's the cleaner, the maintenance guy, uh, the guest communications team. Uh, make no mistake about it, this is a hospitality business. And so the reviews are a critical component of making sure that, that you are uh, able to, to, to manage through that process. And so um, how do you handle bad reviews, right? So there, bad reviews will happen. Um, how do you prevent or be proactive when things are going bad? 
Um, and things almost will, a, a lot of times will. And honestly, from, from running this business, I actually prefer when things go bad simply because that, that guest is going to rate you based on how you perform, right? So if you have an AC that goes out and it's Saturday at 1030 at night, um, you know, if you are able to have a handyman show up within 30 minutes, uh, even if they didn't immediately get it rectified, the fact that we were very responsive uh, alone will show a positive response. Um, so don't be wary of things that go wrong. Um, it's all about how you handle those things when they do go wrong uh, to make sure that you can kind of um, come up, come out of that with a, with a positive uh, outcome. All right, so we're getting close to winding down our time here. One last attempt. Uh, and if you think about it later, feel free to send it to me. I'm um, going to put my email here in the chat. Is there anything that comes up that you want to have us cover? Um, all right, Sheila's also asking, um, I was wondering if a host are giving a generous or honest review. Is there anyone I can speak with outside of this meeting since it's going to end soon? <laughs> um, if hosts are giving honest or generous review. Right, so Sheila, I'd be happy to touch base with you um, if you wanna talk more uh, information about that. I just put my email address in the chat. Um, so feel free to use that. Um, the other thing to mention, um, each of these uh, webinars are recorded. And so um, you can go back. Uh, all the things that I've said we've covered already, uh, like earlier in the year, we actually had um, a representative from Airbnb that we did an interview with, for example. Um, so if you want to go back, I think the last 90 days, are on the REI USA platform, they're the recordings of the monthly meetings. Um, beyond that, there is a, a recent REI YouTube channel that you can look up as well. And so um, pretty much all of the, not only my monthly webinars from BNB Investing, but all of the uh, other folks that are doing different Zoom meetings, uh, they're being archived on YouTube. So you can go back and kind of view if there's a particular topic of interest uh, or a particular area that you wanted to, to brush up on, um, you, could, you could definitely do that. Um, let's see here, did I? All right, let me resend my email, sorry about that. There we go, hopefully you can see it now. All right. Perfect. So if we don't have any other comments or questions, again, feel free to email me later if you um, have any particular things that you'd like to see us cover uh, going forward. Um, a quick update for Atlanta. I know some of you are uh, based in Atlanta, even though we have other folks from other areas. Uh, on Monday, um, on the, actually just yesterday, uh, the City Council of Atlanta just voted to approve the zoning uh, proposal to include all zoning um, dwelling, residential dwellings for the short-term rental ordinance, which goes into effect um, March, 2022. And unfortunately, it's the ordinance is still very non-investor friendly. It requires that you are a primary residence uh, in Atlanta, and you can do that property uh, as well as one additional property. So City of Atlanta starting March, 2022, uh, it is not going to be uh, easy to do multiple properties as an out-of-state investor. Um, we are working with um, uh, the city of Atlanta to uh, work through some of those details uh, because it doesn't really address um, how that is um, relates to uh, like a master lease strategy, like I talked about earlier, uh, or a legal entity. And so I think there's some opportunity. Uh, we've actually just formed a new nonprofit association. I'm going to put that in the in the chat as well. If you're in Atlanta, 
please go check that out. Please join it. Um, we are basically doing uh, a lobbying effort uh, in Atlanta to have um, discussions around the details of those rules that they're going to roll out and uh, make sure that we can have um, the ability. A lot of us have not only properties that we own, but we have properties that we manage for other investors. And um, we want to make sure we have a seat at the table for that. So um, ATLMA.org, uh, click on that link. Um, the STROAGA, which is a statewide uh, association for Georgia, Short Term Metal Owners Association of Georgia, is still very active um, on the state level. So we created um, the Atlanta Metro uh, Association to be a little bit more specific. And uh, there's also some things coming up in Cobb County. And unfortunately, the cab as well. A lot of the counties in the Atlanta metro area were waiting for the city to um, determine what they're going to do with their ordinances. And so don't be surprised going into next year if we have some similar uh, type rules in the outlying areas uh, of Atlanta. Um, and so to stay up to date with that, um, take a look at that website, uh, join it or support it or get involved. And um, uh, happy to uh, answer any questions about that as well. So with that, I'm going to conclude the meeting. Um, thanks, everybody, for spending some time with us. And I uh, hope everybody has a happy holiday. And we will definitely see you guys uh, next year. So everybody take care. <laughs>